Martin W. Stone, we talked at some length about the agony that he went through because of his indoctrination in Calvinism. He had a very difficult time uh, coming to the point in his life where he believed that one could hear the gospel and just obey it. This was a very mm -hmm. difficult concept for one who had been uh, entrenched in the Calvinistic doctrine. But at last, uh, he was able to come to grips with, uh, with his uh, quest for religion, and he became a member of the Presbyterian Church. In 1793, uh, Barton applied for a license to preach in the Presbyterian Church with the Orange Presbytery. The subject that was assigned to him was the attributes of God and the Trinity, and he was uh, coached in this area by William Hodge, he passed the examination, but he still was not a licensed preacher for the Presbyterians. Apparently the way that it went is that you pass the examination, and then six months later when the Presbytery met again, uh, then at that time you were given your license to preach. And then after that, you were ordained. So there was a three-step process. The first step was to pass the examination, which he did. Well, in the interim, uh, during the waiting period, he ran out of money and he began to doubt whether he wanted to be a preacher or not. So without uh, getting his license, he went down into Georgia and there took a teaching job in a school run by Hope Ho. Now it's a small world. We talked a couple of weeks ago, or maybe just last week, about James O'Kelly. Well, Hope Ho was a, an associate of James O'Kelly and had uh, been in with James O'Kelly in uh, resisting, I started to say fighting, but resisting maybe is a better word, uh, the uh, overbearing spirit of uh, uh, Francis Asbury, the superintendent of the Methodist Church. So there he was in a Methodist school run by, by uh, Hope Ho. And during this time, he, his interest in being a preacher was revived, and so he returned in 1796 to North Carolina to get his license. The first thing that he did after getting his license was to go off into eastern North Carolina, a very hard mission field, and he became discouraged there, and he left and went down into Virginia and preached at a place called Brian's Meeting House, a Presbyterian meeting house, for several months. Leaving the Grimes Meeting House, he then went into Tennessee, and he passed through Nashville. It's interesting that his comment about Nashville <coughs> He said it was a poor little village hardly worth notice. <laughs> a friend told him about Kentucky. Go west, young man, was the call to Barton W. Stone from his friend. And so he eventually made his way to Cane Ridge in what is now Kentucky. Cane Ridge was explored and named by Daniel Boone. It was named because of the stand of canes in that area. A man named Robert Finley, a Presbyterian preacher, had moved into this area, and I believe he was the second, as I recall, preacher to preach in the old Cane Ridge Meeting House. He had moved there to preach in the Cane Ridge Meeting House and also to start a seminary, they call it a log cabin seminary, about a quarter mile uh, away from Cane Ridge. This is the old meeting house, pretty much as it looked in the early days when Barton W. Stone was there, with the exception that there was no chinking between the logs. This was wild country in those early days, and they could see any problem with the Indians coming upon them by not having any chinking between the logs is a good space. Of course, it made for cold winters, but uh, that, they felt, was necessary. Now, I, I'll just take a second here to, to mention uh, more about the, the, the log cabin. This is the largest one-room log cabin in the United States, and I only learned that when Janice and I went back to Cane Ridge this uh, last uh, July, and the caretaker there, who is a member of the Disciples of Christ, they have complete control of that. I uh, pointed that out a couple of times. That's the largest one-room log cabin in the United States. Now, it looks like it would seat about 15 or 20, doesn't it? Well, that was my first impression. It's just a tiny little thing, and I was amazed that they say it will seat 300 people. Now, doesn't that shock you? Well, now when you move inside, first of all, here's your doorway way down here. So that's what's kind of deceiving. It looks like maybe uh, that it's just about eight feet tall. It's much taller than that. This is the inside of the Cane Ridge Meeting House. And in the, uh, the early days when Martin W. Stone was there, it had the, the gallery, as they call it. We call it a balcony. 
And guess what the gallery was used for primarily? Pardon me? Slaves. The slaves had to go up into the gallery, and that was their place. Now, the way that they got up into the gallery was, see this little, it, it's really a doorway. It's, it's called a window, but it's, it's really about this tall, as I recall. So there was a ladder outside, and they went up in uh, through, the, uh, through that, and once they got up there, there's a lot of room. We had church services uh, in the old Cambridge meeting place the Sunday that we were back there, and it, it is amazing how many people can get in that place. I, I, I don't know about 300, but I guess if you're small and squeezed together, maybe. But you see there are pews this way, and pews this way, and over on this side there are more pews this way, and there's pews that way. And then you go upstairs and there's the gallery. So it looks like a little tiny meeting place, but actually it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good place to meet. Well, they through the years uh, did some remodeling and they took the galley out and they took it to a farmer's barn and when they renovated this thing and brought it back to the way it was in 1936 as I recall, they went over to the barn and there the galley was still in perfect order. They removed it, took it back and put it in the uh, old log cabin and there it is today. The visitor goes today and he can enjoy uh, going inside and seeing pretty much what it looked like except for the chinking and a few other improvements. The original flooring in it was just dirt. And then the second flooring was where they take logs and they, they slice them in half and I don't remember what you call that kind of a flooring, but that was the flooring, the second flooring that was used. Now today as you, uh, if we had, I don't suppose we have a, a TV here, I've got a video that I could show you if time permits uh, where we can, you can see firsthand some of these things. But, when you, when you go up to the Cane Ridge Meeting House today, you don't see that at all. What do you suppose you see? I know I'm going to get off camera a second here, but I've got to point this out. This is what you see today. And you, you think, oh, they've ruined it. But actually what they've done is they, they've put this uh, shell over the old Cane Ridge Meeting House to protect it from the elements. There, it's withstood all this time from 18 or 1790, let's see, what's it? I believe 1790 was the original uh, year it was built. So, anyway, the Disciples of Christ in 1952 uh, decided to put that uh, covering over the old cabin to, to protect it uh, from now on. So, it's good and it's bad. You'd like to see it in its original condition as you go up to it, but once you get inside, you can still see it's, uh, it's there and it's exciting to uh, go in and to, uh, to kind of feel a part of history. The old podium, I believe, the same one that was there in the days of, uh, of stone, is still there. And it's, uh, it's very primitive, and it's very interesting, and it's exciting. It was many uh, years, I guess, that I waited to make that trip back there, and I wasn't disappointed at all. Well, so this is the old Cambridge meeting house that uh, Finley, the Presbyterian preacher, preached in. And uh, he, at his seminary, a quarter mile away, he trained 12 Presbyterian preachers, three of those Presbyterian preachers, uh, turned out to participate in the restoration movement with Martin Stone. If you look on your green sheet, the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery, I think you may see the names Richard McNamara, John Dunlevy, and John Thompson. Those were three of the twelve ministers that uh, Finley trained. Well, Finley lost his position there. He was deposed uh, from the synod of uh, the area for insubordination, October the 6th, 1796. Finley didn't follow the straight Presbyterian line, and I think it got him into trouble, and this may have accounted for some of the Presbyterian preachers that were produced by uh, him that uh, favored a restoration of the New Testament church as opposed to a hard Calvinistic line. One account that I read, in fact, it was the official a booklet put out by the disciples at the uh, log cabin itself said that uh, Finley was seen coming home in a drunken state or at least to a point of intoxication and uh, that got him into trouble. That may or may not be true. It may have just been an excuse to get rid of him more easily. At any rate, they did remove him and the next one in his place was Barton W. Stone. A young man, age 24, began to preach at the Cambridge Meeting House, and about 10 or 12 miles away is a little place called Concord, and he alternated between Cambridge and Concord in his preaching and kept busy. 
Now, during this time, he was licensed, but he was not ordained to preach. It may well be that these two congregations made arrangements with Stone directly without going through the presbytery. Well, Stone left this area for a while, and when he came back, the two congregations applied to the presbytery, the Transylvania Presbytery, to have uh, an ordained preacher, to have Barton W. Stone actually ordained and preached for them as an ordained Presbyterian minister. Well, in preparation, Stone examined once again the creed of the Presbyterian Church. The creed of the Presbyterian Church is the Westminster Confession of Faith. So as he re-examined this, he begins to shake his head a little bit and say, this is not according to the scriptures. This is not exactly right. So he thought he'd better talk this over with a couple of them, and he called in uh, two men and uh, asked them, what should I do? James Blythe was one man, Robert Marshall was another. What should I do about this? I'm not in, in full accord with this. And they said, well, how, how far can you, can you give uh, uh, your approval? How much can you, can you accept? And he says, well, as much as it is consistent with the Word of God. That's really no endorsement at all. That's really a qualified endorsement. So they said, well, I think you're going to be all right. So the Transylvania Presbytery met in 1798 in that same little log cabin that we've been talking about. And Stone was asked the question. Now, this is for real. This is not a warm-up. The question is, do you receive and adopt the confession of faith as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Bible? Now, Stone has to answer. His answer is exactly this. I do, as far as I see it consistent with the Word of God. Just about the same thing that he told Life and Marshall. Now, it's amazing that they accepted this qualified endorsement of the Westminster Confession of Faith. But he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister. Now, since Calvinism is such a problem, was such a problem for, for so many that uh, we've talked about, John Calvin came onto the scene, taught this terrible doctrine of Calvinism, and it confused many people and caused many people to refuse to accept the truth uh, for all of their lives, some of them, and some of them finally overcoming it. But they, the proponents of, uh, of this doctrine of Calvinism used the acronym TULIP, and I, I took this right out of a, a, a Calvinistic book. The proponents used T-U-L-I-P. T, they say total depravity. This is in their wording, just quoted verbatim. Man is totally unable to save himself on account of a fall in the Garden of Eden being a total fall. Now, that, if you dig a little further, there is nothing that he can do about it. If he is lost, he's lost. If he's saved, he's saved. He is predestined to either be saved or lost. You, unconditional election. If unable to save himself, then God must save. If God must save, then God must be free to save whom he will. In other words, you don't accept or reject. God pre-selects you. L in the tulip. Limited atonement or particular redemption. If God has decreed to save whom he will, then it is for those that Christ made atonement on the cross. Did you see the significance there? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whom? For the whole world. That's who Jesus died for. But Calvinism says, no, only for those who are predestined to be saved. Now the I is irresistible calling. If Christ died for them, then the Holy Spirit will effectually call them into salvation. And the P of Tulip is perseverance of the saints. If salvation then comes from the beginning, uh, has been of God, the end will also be of God, and the saints will persevere to eternal joy. Those are the exact words of the, the little booklet that promotes Calvinism. At the time of Stone's ordination as a Presbyterian minister, it's clear that Stone's respect for the Bible was growing, and his respect for man-made doctrines such as the Westminster Confession of Faith was decreasing. He was fighting his way out of the bondage of the false doctrine of Calvinism. According to J.M. Powell, who has an excellent book called The Cause We Plead, at the, uh, said at this time that Stone was out of sympathy with all five points of Calvinism. Perhaps it's more accurate to say that he was struggling to free himself of, in all five areas taught by the Calvinists. Eventually, he was able to rid himself of those shackles that caused him so much sorrow, so much grief. Stone came to 
understand that saving faith is produced by the teachings of the Bible. And those who accept, believe, and obey the teachings of the Bible can, by the grace of God, be saved, can become children of God. And that is totally uh, different from what he was taught under Calvinism. Later, Stone spoke with great uh, feeling of his disgust for uh, Calvinism. Listen to what he has to say. This uh, came from the autobiography of uh, Barton W. Stone. Let me here speak when I shall be lying under the clogs of the grave. Calvinism is among the heaviest clogs on Christianity in the world. It is a dark mountain between heaven and earth and is amongst the most discouraging hindrances to sinners in seeking the kingdom of God and engenders bondage to gloominess to the saints. In reading of the terrible trials that Barton Stone went through, trying to rid himself of this man-made doctrine of Calvinism, you have to, to conclude that he would have been better off to have had no religion at all than to be so engulfed in this thing. It's like a serpent that was hanging on to it, injecting its poison. He had to get rid of the serpent and to get rid of the poison before the pure gospel uh, could be taken in. At this time, at the turn of the century, there was a great religious awakening occurring. It was called the second great religious awakening in the West. But it was occurring and it was a, it was a, a something to behold. Stone heard about it over in Logan County, and he made up his mind to go over there and to hear James uh, uh, McGrady. Remember we talked about him? He was the preacher that came to the school where young Stone, as an 18-year-old, was a student. And McGrady came, the Presbyterian, with the, the fiery sermons and preached it. Well, this same McGrady is over in Logan County. And he's holding one of these mass meetings, and some weird things are going on. A great deal of emotionalism is occurring. And so he makes up his mind that he's got to go over there. And after he does go, he is impressed again with McGreedy's power of preaching. But he is not impressed with a message. But he is impressed with the overall revival spirit. And he makes up his mind, we've got to have one of those in Cane Ridge. Well, that was a great undertaking. McGreedy preached the doctrine of Calvinism, that man was totally depraved and had no ability to believe except through the miraculous regeneration. Now, Barton Stone wants to preach in such a great meeting as that, but he does not want to preach the same doctrine that McGreedy preached. This doctrine being true, Stone reasoned, that, that only man, uh, that, that only the Spirit can regenerate man, and if he doesn't, then he can't be saved. He could not make that fit with the persuading of men to believe and to repent. What good does it do to preach men, preach for men to repent? and to obey if they can't do anything about it, if they're already lost or already saved. So this kind of reasoning caused him to be more firm in his appreciation of the biblical teachings of the Bible and how to become a child of God as opposed to Calvinism. We'll talk later on about uh, good old raccoon John Smith. He agonized with this. He was up preaching one time in a little congregation. In fact, Janice and I went to that little uh, community. It's just a little uh, creek community. Uh, with an old church building that, that, uh, that Raccoon John used to preach in, still standing there. But he was up preaching, and he was preaching for them, trying to persuade them to believe and obey the gospel. And it came to him, what am I doing? If the Baptist doctrine is right, then I shouldn't be teaching these people to try to cause them to repent and obey since their destiny is already determined. And he got so confused that he just stopped. He said, I am... I really am unable to continue, and he sat down. That was the end of his sermon. He was coming to the same kind of realization that Barton W. Stone was. The doctrine of Calvinism is, is contrary to the Word of God. Whosoever will may come. Stone made plans for this religious revival at Cane Ridge, but he had something to take care of before uh, that was to occur. He traveled 200 miles over to Greenville, Kentucky on July the 2nd, 1801, and married Elizabeth Campbell, no relation as we mentioned last week to Alexander Campbell, married Elizabeth Campbell. Thereafter, he would always, I think, call her Eliza, and Eliza was his beloved wife, even though he married again later on. He still could never get over his first wife. The Stones built a cabin a few miles east of Cane Ridge on a 105-acre parcel that he had bought a couple of years before. Now, I don't know, I'm going to have to move away from the camera there. 
I don't know if you can see this very well or not, but this, this structure uh, still uh, stands today uh, in the vicinity of Cane Ridge. Now, the original cabin that uh, Barton built for his Eliza was right there. These, you see these little two doors. This two-story had nothing to do with the original structure, just this little small area. That was the original uh, cabin that he built for his, his bride. So they lived together, had five children, one boy, Barton Jr., and four girls, and she died after nine years of marriage, leaving him uh, a widower with five children. The following year, you know, in those days, men didn't uh, wait too long to get married. They, they needed the, the helpmate. They, uh, of course, uh, needed the companionship. But I found almost all of the uh, restorers married quickly. Thereafter, that was a compliment to the first wife, I guess. But he married in 1811, the next year. He married uh, uh, Celia Bowen. Now, by Celia, uh, he had several more children. He had enough to make four basketball teams minus one. <laughs> 19 kids. So he, he was a prolific producer. In August 1801, now the area around Cane Ridge was uh, filled with wagons uh, and carriages and people on horseback and people walking, all converging on the Cane Ridge area. It's estimated, and this is amazing, it's probably the, the most amazing uh, gospel meeting that ever took place in the United States. People on horseback, wagons, carriages on foot, converged to Cane Ridge, estimated 20 to 30,000 people came to that gospel meeting. We haven't had one like that lately, have we? 20 to 30,000 people. They had 18 Presbyterians preaching, some Baptists, some Methodists. Primarily, they were Presbyterians, but there were a few of the others. Meetings were held on the ridge with five or six people generally preaching at a time. I don't know how they did it at Pentecost, but I always kind of felt like maybe that was the way it was done. One apostle was over here preaching, one over here, and one over here. Maybe they did just take turns. I don't know. But I know at Cane Ridge, they ran five or six at a time. They went for six days, day and night, it says, without rest. Now, Barton Stone got so tired that he was on the point of a total uh, physical uh, uh, problem of exhaustion, and the supplies ran out, finally, and they had to call the meeting to a close. But from what I read, Barton Stone was almost uh, going to, uh, into a, a situation where it could have even been fatal. He was uh, exerting himself, preaching constantly, and weird things were taking place. The same kind of things that took place over at Logan County with McGreedy preaching. Uh, subjects would scream and fall flat on the ground, and they might lie there for uh, several hours and then wake up and, uh, and begin all over again. Various parts of the body would jerk uh, violently. The jerking would cause grunts that sound like barking. Uh, this continued on and on. It, one fellow took a tally of how many succumbed to the preaching. I, you know, it's just a, a, uh, an emotional thing. They just kept going and going and without rest, and they're, they're uh, encouraging each other, and, and they're getting so excited. You see the same thing happen today in Pentecostal meetings. They just get out of control, and that's pretty much what happened. But one man took a tally that 3,000 succumbed to the, to the preaching. That is, they had 3,000 people flopping around, barking and dancing and grunting and, and going through all kinds of weird gyrations. Well, that really is, is kind of beside the point, except that it was a phenomenon that weird things took place. These preachers, most of them, or at least some of them, were preaching free salvation based on faith and repentance. Now that was not Presbyterian doctrine. That was not Calvinistic doctrine. And somebody was going to have to answer for it. Preachers who didn't believe that way uh, began to be very concerned when they heard Barton Stone and uh, some of the others preach that way. And so uh, they were called on the carpet by the presbytery and they were censored. There were five of them uh, that were censored by the uh, presbytery. And Barton Stone was one of them. Those who stood with Stone were Barton, uh, of course Barton was number one, uh, David Purviance, a name that you haven't heard before, and I've got his picture, but it's uh, it, it really not necessary to show you. Uh, then there was uh, John Dunleavy, John Thompson, and uh, let's see, there's one other one that I, Robert Marshall. Uh, these five stood together, and the presbytery uh, said, you are censored for what you did. You taught something that is not in accordance with Presbyterian doctrine. But that wasn't enough. It was not enough that they would be censored. 
they were going to be called on the carpet before the Synod of Kentucky. And the first one to go before the Synod was uh, Dunleavy. And uh, it was obvious from the way that they treated John Dunleavy that the other four were going to be treated exactly the same way. So before they were called in, they said, let's have a little meeting here and decide what we're going to do. What they decided to do was to pull out of the association altogether, those five. And that's exactly what they did. So in the uh, proceedings, they, they told them that they were leaving uh, the association and they added this one little thing, the Confession of Faith, that's the Westminster Confession of Faith, said it was an impediment to revival. They, I don't know what else they said, but they certainly uh, dropped that on the, the Synod, uh, that their Westminster Confession of Faith was in, not an encouragement, but it was a hindrance. Well, Stone later on would write these words about that event. He said, the distinguished doctrine preached by us now, this is, uh, Anne, if you, if you like a long sentence, this sentence has 112 words. And uh, I, I've noticed that a lot of the, the writings, they, they didn't use periods. They just put a dash, dash, and would keep on going. But, but listen to what he says. It's a great restoration statement. The distinguished doctrine preached by us that God loved the world, the whole world, and sent his son to save them on condition that they believed in him, that the gospel was the means of salvation, but that this means would never be effectual to this end until believed and obeyed by us, there's more, that God required us to believe in his Son and had given us sufficient evidence in his word to produce faith in us, if attended by us, that sinners were capable of understanding and believing this testimony and of acting upon it by coming to the Savior and obeying him and from him obtaining salvation and the Holy Spirit. Now that's a long sentence, but that's a good sentence. That's a a good restoration statement. And Bart Stone says, that's what we preached. You can see why they got in trouble with the Calvinists. You can see why the Presbyterians uh, thought they were heretics and called them such. Well, how did all this set with Calvinism? It didn't set at all. Calvinism declared that a man uh, was depraved and could do nothing to be saved. He had to wait and to see if God saw fit to save him. And if he didn't see fit to save him, then he didn't save him. If he saw fit to save him, then he saved him. But it was all to the glory of God. Well, Stone and his group said that God loved man. God wanted man to be saved. God provided the means whereby he could be saved, provided the gospel, and that man had the power to believe the gospel and to obey the gospel and thus be saved and become his children. In 1804... <coughs> Barton Stone had come this far. Well, when these five men withdrew from the Synod of Kentucky, they set up their own presbytery almost immediately. And isn't it strange? You know, they, they said, this is not what we want. They pull out, and then they start another presbytery called the Springfield Presbytery. But they sent out letters to the congregations that they had worked with and uh, had, uh, had known, explaining to them why they had removed themselves from the, uh, uh, the Synod. And then they wrote an apology for renouncing the jurisdiction of the Synod of Kentucky. And by an apology, they're not saying we were wrong in doing it. They're just saying, this is the explanation. This is our reasoning. This is why we did it. And it was uh, written uh, by Marshall, by Stone, and Thompson. At least all three had a part in writing that explanation. But they wanted their former brethren to understand why they left the uh, Synod. And the, by doing it that way, they probably took a lot of people uh, with them. Well, for six years, Stone had preached as a Presbyterian for Cane Ridge and Concord, and now he calls the, the members of those congregations together. He had a contract with them, a financial agreement, and he tore up that financial agreement before them. He had uh, released his slaves. He had no means of support at that point, and uh, he is willing to set out, though, because he's going to preach the gospel. Now, he has a farm, and when does he do his farming? Uh, often, he had to do his farming at night, and during the daytime, he might ride or uh, take a carriage some distance away to preach. And then he might have to come back and, and uh, work his farm at night again in order to preach. But this he did, and he preached to large audiences, the record said. Well, he was popular among the people, and he would remain, even though he now has renounced Presbyterianism, he would remain in this log cabin for uh, preaching to those people who previously were Presbyterians until 1811. The Springfield Presbytery was of short life, but it was 
uh, a, an active nine months that it existed. During that time, 15 congregations pointing to the restoration were established, seven in Ohio and eight in Kentucky. Uh, in June of 1804, uh, they published what you have in your hand, the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. Now that document contains about 800 words, but it is amazing in its content. It's advanced. Nowadays we could write that and nobody would think much about it perhaps. But in 1804, what a document to declare their independence from denominationalism and their intention to restore New Testament Christianity. Let's notice just a few of the, of the things, and we won't read it all. Uh, the, the, the second paragraph, we will that this body die, be dissolved, and sink into union with the body of Christ at large, for there is but one body and one spirit, even as we are called in one hope of our calling. Number two, we will that the name, that our name of distinction with its reverend title be forgotten, that there be but one Lord over God's heritage and his name one. And let's see, let's look on down. You can, in your own uh, free time, see several things there. We will, uh, that our power of making laws for the government of the church and executing them by delegated authority forever cease. What a, that, that's a, a major item there. There's no justification for synods and conferences to create laws to govern the church. That isn't biblical, and that's not going to be uh, from now on. Uh, second uh, paragraph from the bottom, or maybe it's the last paragraph from the bottom. We will that candidates for the gospel ministry henceforth study the Holy Scriptures with fervent prayer and obtain license from God to preach the simple gospel with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven without any mixture of philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, or the rudiments of the world, and so on. So it just gets, it gets good and gooder. We will that the Church of Christ resume her native right of eternal internal uh, government, try her candidates for the ministry, as to their soundness in the faith, acquaintance with experimental religion, gravity, and atmos to teach, uh, and admit no other proof of their authority but Christ speaking to them. We will, uh, third paragraph on the next page, we will that the people henceforth take the Bible as the only sure guide to heaven, and as many as are offended with other books which stand in competition with it, may cast them into the fire if they choose. For it is better to enter into life having one book than having many to be cast into hell. Finally, the last one, and these are all good. We will that all our sister bodies read their Bibles carefully, that they may see their faith, their determined, and prepare for death before it's too late. Look who signed it. Robert Marshall, we heard about him before. John Dunleavy, yes. Richard McNamara, yes, B.W. Stone, yes, John Thompson, and David Purvians. So an amazing document. You can imagine uh, the people over, uh, would pour over this document at night and say, you know, that makes sense, that makes sense. And you can see why uh, that uh, this movement began to, uh, to uh, really expand like, uh, I think, as Stone put it, like uh, fire in dry stubble. It really moved quickly, it made sense. People were tired of the man-made doctrines. They were tired of denominationalism. This is a fresh breath of air. Let's just go back to the Bible. Let's forget the doctrines of men. Let's forget the manuals. Let's forget the creeds and the disciplines. Let's forget all of this stuff that's foreign to the scriptures and just go to the Bible. Well, it was necessary to let the Springfield Presbytery die because they realized that while they were advocating a return, to New Testament Christianity, they had no authority at all for uh, such as a presbytery. While Stone and his group were looking to restore New Testament Christianity, the denominations couldn't stand it. A lot of bad things were said about Barton and the others. A lot of evil reports were circulated about them. Untrue things were said. The term new lights uh, was a term of derision that they applied to Barton Stone. New light Christian church, they called it. And uh, I... I was talking to somebody not an awful long time ago whose relatives were called New Light Christians. And I think that all goes back to the time when they were trying to say bad things about uh, Barton Stone. Uh, New Light meant uh, kind of a, a rebel, kind of an offshoot, not, a, not something to take seriously. Well, the, uh, it's kind of interesting to, to notice that after this time, Barton Stone signed his name, Barton W. Stone, ECC. What do you suppose ECC would be? Elder in the Church of Christ. 
the, uh, more than often, the name Christian Church was applied, but they were used interchangeably. Uh, church of Christ and Christian Church, but more than often, it was Christian Church. Although, as long as the Christian Messenger was published, uh, it was uh, always stated on there, Editor Martin W. Stone, Elder Church of Christ. Independent Bible study caused these men to abandon infant baptism and a sprinkling, and this was a, a major step for a stone in his group. Remember, coming out of Presbyterianism, sprinkling was the way that it was done. But the preachers first baptized each other by immersion and then baptized their congregation. I'd like to read to you uh, from Barton's own words about baptism. This, this is tough, you know. You're, you're going from, from one body of teaching to another. You're, you're going from one thing that you've practiced all of your life. And you read the scriptures and you say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I've got to change. Now what do we do? Well, he said, uh, let's get down this part. Uh, he says, now the question arose, once they decide they needed to be immersed, he says, the question arose, who will baptize us? The Baptist will not, except we unite with them. And there's no elders among us who had, who had been immersed. They still had this idea of you had to be an immersed person to immerse somebody else. Well, it was finally concluded among us that if we were authorized to preach, we were authorized to baptize. Good thinking. The work then commenced. The preachers baptized one another. The crowds came and we, they were also baptized. My congregations were very generally submitted to it and it soon obtained generally, uh, and it soon obtained generally, uh, generally submitted to it and it soon obtained generally and yet the pulpit was silent on the subject, meaning he didn't preach uh, much about it. In Brother Marshall's congregation, there were many who wished baptism. As Brother Marshall had not yet faith in the ordinance, I was called upon to administer. This, this pleased him and a few others. You see, this, this wasn't a quick slice. Everybody believes in um, immersion, and everybody submits to it. Uh, this was a uh, gradual thing. Some had to take a little longer to uh, get it straight in their mind. But eventually, uh, Stone says, uh, there isn't one in 500 who hasn't been immersed within their group. The subject of baptism, this is still from the autobiography of, uh, of uh, Stone. The subject of baptism now engaged the attention of the people very generally, and some, with myself, began to conclude that it was ordained for the remission of sins. All right, now you've got two steps. One is to determine it isn't sprinkling, it's immersion. The second step is, what's it for? They began to determine, yes, it is for the remission of sins, and ought to be administered in the name of Jesus to all believing penitents. I remember once, about this time, we had a great meeting at Concord. Mourners were invited every day to collect before the stand in order for prayers, for this was the custom. The brethren were praying daily for the same people, and none seemed to be comforted. I was considering in my mind, what could be the cause? The words of Peter at Pentecost rolled through my mind. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I thought, were Peter, were Peter here, he would thus address these mourners. I quickly arose and addressed them in the same language and urged them to comply. So we've got to admire uh, Barton Stone, a very conscientious man, a very sincere man, always kind. He ran into some difficulty and he rose to the occasion to fight against it. But always Barton W. Stone found it in his heart to be kind and considerate of others. For a time, I'm going to quit right there. I, I was going to take up Shakerism, but it's, it's too good to take up in five minutes. <laughs> because this was, a, this was a problem. Everything was going great for, for Stone and, and his fellow preachers. And they were out converting people and establishing congregations. And then the Shakers came down from New York and, and really hurt the restoration movement for a while. Badly. Do you have any questions or any comments you'd like to make? Yes. Calvinism today, the people that are preaching and teaching it, how then do they convince someone that they need to be part of that religion with saying that there's nothing you can do to be saved, there's nothing you can do to be lost? If they come up to you, why don't you just say, um, I'm not going to do anything. If I'm saved, I'm saved. If I'm not, I'm not. Well, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how they would answer that. The, the booklet that I pulled this information from was the uh, Bab Inverness Baptist Church. And uh, so I know that it's still taught today. I don't know if Presbyterianism still teaches it as it was taught then. I'm, I'm relating it to you from a historical uh, standpoint. But I don't, uh, to me, there would be no answer. There is no reason if someone is predestined to be saved or to be lost, there is no use for me encouraging you to obey. Because that's already been taken care of. 
the marshal that was taught that you talked about that, mm -hmm. that defected, Robert, Robert Marshall, mm -hmm. was that the same marshal that he went to, to uh, that he called in and asked questions of uh, before he was ordained with the presbytery? I, I don't think so, Lee. I th the, it was the, the same marshal that was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, but he, he just wasn't quite convinced. He just didn't quite have it uh, uh, in his mind yet as, uh, to the extent that, uh, that Stone had it. And we're going to find out that uh, four, four of these key people, David Purviance is the only one that didn't leave him, four left him in the next short while. Marshall County. We're going to find that out first, first part of next week when Shakerism comes in. Anything further? Hey, I love this stuff. I hope you do. <laughs> it's exciting. These are, these are my friends that we're talking about, and I really enjoy uh, talking about them, and, and uh, I think they're inspiring. I think they're just great, because they, they had the courage of their convictions. They just weren't content to sit by and keep the religion of their forefathers and say, it's all right, it doesn't matter, it mattered. It mattered to them, and it ought to matter to us today. Thank you.